Hi all, my name is Danielle Harrington. Thanks so much for joining me today. This short segment is meant for upper level undergraduates, probably juniors, say in a form and analysis course. And an ideal audience member would be a student in advanced theory who is also midway through their music history study. So hermeneutics. What are they? This is a word that I ran into over and over in my early grad days, but had never really heard spoken in the classroom, only seen it in print in respected journals. And each time I'd run into it, I'd look it up and try to understand it again. So I think it'd be really beneficial to flesh out this concept for you, connecting it to structural analysis and how we can immediately start using hermeneutic methodologies as a regular tool so hermeneutics involve the act of interpreting or reading a piece of music, not just identifying precise musical components, but truly contextualizing cultural characteristics that lead to style. Scholars employ a useful system in order to illuminate potential layers of expressive meaning, and this is called topic theory. It's a stream of semiotics, or the study and interpretation of signs, symbols, and signifiers. And rather than examining the score through purely structural modes, like Roman numeral analysis or phrase relationships alone, an analyst can unpack elements of a musical work, its topics, to unearth cultural and stylistic implications that provide a richer story. Now, before we look at an example of topic theory in action, let me quickly highlight some of the scholars critical to the evolution of this theory. We have noted, noted theorist Leonard Ratner, who began the study of topoi, or 18th century musical topics, in his seminal text, Classic Music, Expression, Form, and Style in 1980. He defined topics as subjects for musical discourse. So think of each topic as being in conversation with the next or previous, sort of juxtaposed ideas and how they interact. You may already do something along these lines when you break down the score and start to look at certain sections. Now, Ratner first identified topics in two ways, either as types or as styles. And now a type is the entire piece, like a dance or a march, a saraband or a gavotte, while styles are segments within the work. Despite this division of type and style, a topic can be both a type and style, leading to this layering and merging and transformation of topics. And since Ratner codified the theory 40 years ago, it's been further developed by other theorists like why Allenbrook, Robert Hatton, Kofi Agawu, Raymond Monell, and Eratrastri, just to name a few, if you really like this concept and want to keep, keep discovering more. I like to think of topics as conventional devices in the 18th century composer's toolbox. He could pull from these referen referential gestures to elicit a host of meanings associated with places like the theater or chamber works or uh, the church, different types of people, whether they be of high class or low class, and different styles. By using topics, we can connect to expressive attitudes and affects common to 18th century listeners. Indeed, topic theory is a means of contextualizing through structural analysis. Popular topics include the pastoral, Sturmunterang, Enfinsamkeit, Mannhofbracket, the singing, learned, hunt, brilliant styles, and many, many more. You may have recognized some of these topics that just sort of rattled off and may not even known that they were considered to be topics. Okay, I'm now going to change the screen here so that you can see a score, and we're going to move on to looking at an example, hearing topics at play. Today's example is Mozart's Die Zauberflitte, or The Magic Flute, from 1791. And it's an exemplar of topics being deployed often, both types and styles, and layered atop each other, which generates this very complex, expressive content that we experience. And for today's quick example, we'll be looking at just the beginning of Die Zauberflitte's overture. So, 
Here we go. So for the example that we're going to be looking at today, I just want to give credit where credit is due. It was first examined by the semiotic musicologist Ero Tarastri, and then I elaborated it on it further for today's demonstration, invoking topics discussed by Allenbrook and Agawu. So you'll see here in the score that I have pulled up that when we first start, it sort of begins in this very still moment, and you see these three triads demarcated by the fermatas, and Tarastri says that these act as sort of three knocks that open a Masonic ritual. Now, Die Zauberflitte, you have to know, is an opera that is infused with ideas from Freemasonry, and so we sort of get that ritualistic Masonic feeling coming through, and it's introducing us to the from the very get-go of this ceremony that is about to take place. And layered within that ceremonious feel, we also have the key of three flats. And that is probably in connection with the Holy Trinity, so a sacred topic. And then we also have the harmonic movement of the one chord to the minor six, which signifies the sublime, a concept of, or a harmonic progression often used in the Baroque period for that evocation of the sublime. So we have at least three topics at play in just the first three bars. In the section that follows the main theme, we have a writing style that can be interpreted in two ways. Tarastri argues for a Renaissance polyphony or a vocal learned style, while I read it as a French overture or processional, which is indicated by this double dot figure. Either way, whether, whichever way you read it, that's the great thing about hermeneutics, it carries an air of noble elegance or majesty. And another consideration would be the meter. Duple meter is used throughout the entire Magic Flute Overture, and it often is connected to the divine or the ecclesiastical. And this emphasizes the mystical and mythological plot of the opera. So these five topics happening simultaneously and also in succession produce an isotopy or a repetition of a similar basic trait. Here, that happens to be the pious or the ceremonial. Now, after this occurs for about a minute or so, we get this interruption at the double bar here, of course, with an allegro tempo that indicates that, but the interruption of the dignified to a much more playful topic through the staccato motif. And that's believed to introduce this incessant quality. And the motive actually, interestingly, happens to be a quotation from a Clementi sonata. So we know that Mozart is playing with already established musical ideas and sort of nodding to his contemporary. Now he alters the quotation in a few different ways, but namely the first is this phenomenal accent by going from the piano to a forte on beat four, which creates syncopation. Additionally, more topics are added, like the, um, you can see right here, we have the Zeufzer size, and um, that topic is always a, um, a minor second descent, that chromaticism, sort of holding on and then falling down, and it creates the sense of yearning or sighing. And what's so interesting is the interplay then of juxtaposing this very playful staccati motif against that yearning, emotional, sighing topic. And then, of course, a few measures later, you'll notice here, after we have four measures of that initial mo motive introduced, it's then imitated in a learned topic or fugal treatment. So now that we've dissected multiple layers of these musical happenings, let's listen to the first minute or so and see what we experience. The 
today's topic, Sacred Divine Ecclesiastical. jump ahead just a bit. Imitation learning style. Zoifsercise. Okay, so let's open up the floor to you now. We're going to reflect on this, and I want you to break up into groups of three and let these questions sort of shape your discussion. What did you experience? What did you feel? And do you think the awareness of the topical instances informed your listening? So you have about five minutes. Here we go. This is when people would be talking and I would be switching the screen to introduce the next concept. All right, so the topic theory homework for tonight will mirror the concepts introduced in class today. Here's a small excerpt from Mozart's Fantasy in D minor that I'm giving you right now. <laughs> um, I want you tonight to first identify as many topics as you can. I've given you two handouts. One you can see here on the screen is Agawu's catalog of 27 universal topics. And another is a handout I have made of con topics I've been cataloging over time. Once you've identified as many topics in the example as you can find, bring it back to class tomorrow and we'll work in groups to discuss the interaction of those topics. And I really emphasize this point because you have to remember that this analytical tool can become formalistic. So to take it to that next level, after labeling, you really want to consider how style and structure are dialogical and what meanings, moods, or experiences come from the interplay of the topical gestures. That's what makes it hermeneutic. <laughs> And as we end here, here is a bibliography that just highlights some of the sources I use to inform this lecture today, but are also the major texts right now that will give you more just rich information on topic theory, how to use it, and different examples. Thank you for your time.